There is a video that Johnny recently posted. Speaking of, there's Johnny right there. The rise and fall of Brian Stars. So let's just go ahead and let and watch Johnny's. It will be a react reactception. Hello, friend. This is a video made by F X K Nate, and it is called "The Untold Rise and Fall of Brian Stars." It came out. 13 days ago now it only has 775 a month ago views now. so run it up it's actually a really good video this guy's really cool though and i really respect his opinion because it's very honest and um it's not just like a fuck brian star show which i see a lot of people just kind of do in the world of the internet and everything they're just like fuck this guy fuck him that's easy to do but it's yeah not we talked about that um when i was discussing potentially watching this video was that's kind of why i've always stayed away from brian related content that's put out by people that's not like you know mde members former mde members or damon for example because i feel like a lot of people have so much disdain for this guy but just don't even really know like the half of it like they don't even know uh, what I would say like 50% of truly what makes this guy so manipulative and you know just the whole situation so unfortunate so a lot of the content yeah like Johnny said does come off a lot as like fuck jo uh, fuck fuck Johnny Gilbert <laughs> fuck Brian Starr's content for sure December 18th 2017 Brian Stars would upload his final video I can't believe that's prominent creator with the so world in his eyes now. to a cold husk of his former self what went wrong with Brian Stars? so much my friend and i think so people much. what people i want to say this too i mean a lot of people don't i don't think realize this but me and every single pretty much ever i mean there was probably some mde members that weren't a fan of him but at least for myself i'll say i was a big fan of him and i the reason why i met brian was because i went to his show on the brian stars tour which he did his own tour and i went to the second um tour and i saw catching your clouds and i saw D Physio as a fan of and Vincent Sear and Brian. I have a very similar experience with uh Brian, like getting to meet him and everything. I was a huge fan because obviously, like, you know, you girl loved the interviews back in the day. It just like I'm sure that's how Johnny became a fan of him and everything. Um But yeah, no, I love the interviews. I was I I had watched for a long time. I was one of those people that were like really upset when the Christopher Drew interview came out and um and Brian had his legendary crying moments like that really upset me. I was a huge uh, NSN fan and I was like, no, I'm swearing this guy off like Brian stars forever. I met him at Warp Tour when he was doing a uh, he was doing the Warped YouTubers or whatever. And I actually think Johnny was there with him. It was him, Johnny and Damon. And that was how I initially met them. I was literally a nobody at the time. Like, I think I had a thousand subscribers or something. Brian totally blew me off. Like, just, and, like, completely ignored me. Wore sunglasses, which I later found out he did on purpose. Uh, so he didn't have to look any fans in the eyes. That whole thing. But I still was, like, a diehard fan when he called my parents to, um, my dad specifically, to work out my contract. I remember being, like, so mind blown that, um that Brian was on the, Brian Stars was on the phone with my dad. Like, that was so wild to me. That's how I got to meet him. Seeing his downfall and shit is just as weird for me as it is for the average fan, except that was kind of, you know, obviously implemented into his life. Hello, everybody. The rise Fucking and fall genre is extremely oversaturated. Yeah, I, I agree However, with Johnny on that, too. a YouTuber has slipped through the cracks, a YouTuber that was at true. one point my, my favorite. Very true. Brian Stars. I agree Unless with you're that an a lot. emo loser in the early 2010s like I was, you probably think you've never heard the name Brian Stars, but you have. You may be shocked to know that a YouTuber who exploited minors for money, forcing those minors to perform sexually suggestive. <laughs> Dude, true as fuck though. Like, look at this. Could you imagine? It, I mean, it is true as fuck. Like, I, it's so weird to laugh at that, but I know Johnny's laughing too. Um, I was 17 when, you know, my contract was signed, and literally, like, the way that he got me um, on his management company was. He was debating between um, me and someone named Chris O'Fling, I think his name was, or O'Flying or something. He was a pretty big YouTuber back in the day as well. Um, and he was literally like, it was a toss up between the two of us 50-50 to replace Austin Jones. Speaking of uh, sexual miscon misconduct and oh, shit of the sort, um, the reason that I am in or was in MDE in the first place was because uh, Austin Jones, convicted pedophile, uh, was outed as such and they needed a replacement. So me and Chris Fling in the running for uh, the replacement MDE spot. 
Brian found out how much money I was making and I was signed instantly. Um, I was, he was on the phone with my dad that day. So 100% taking advantage is correct. Like I was a kid, so I would do whatever, whatever. I was probably 15 living at his house, 16. I was probably 16 during this. Which is way and more fucked than what I, I was living at his house. Because it was either that or apparently my, I talked to my mom recently about it. And it was either I was very depressed and shit and going through stuff. So I was either going to be, you know, I eventually somehow got to meet Brian, convince him to like let me him try to help me become a YouTuber. It was either that or I would get sent to military school because I was not going to regular school and I was having a lot of depression oh, episodes. Shit, I didn't and know that. My dad died and I was going through all this shit. So it was either like do this. Or, like, I got the opportunity, and this was before everyone thought people could be, like, creeps, really. We didn't really think about that too much. But, like, he fucking, with a 15-year-old or whatever, 16-year-old, was filming videos, big penis, dirty whisper challenge. Like, what the fuck, Yeah, man? that is fucking Like, I would insane. not do that now. It's crazy how times have changed, man. That's fucking wild. And I was encouraged to do this shit. And then also, during this time, I was the first product of what he started to manage, which meant he would take 20% of our income from everything we would make. So, me being this young... He started taking 20% of every little dollar I started making, and then we eventually started having more people incorporated into our lives, which he also started taking percentages from. Of acts yeah. YouTube videos. Yep, 20%. That was the running in videos. And even Inside covering joke. up a registered convicted sex offender, Austin Jones, has only been covered in length once. Rise and Fall video I've seen about Brian Stars is a video by the Cozy Representative. I'll leave a link. Amazing video. This one actually, that video like is good. this video that we're watching right now, though, I think has to do a little more with like my side of it, like with the MDE world and all that stuff and my own upcoming with him. Cozy Representative is like one of my favorite channels and a really, he's a good friend, actually. He's I watched that one a really long time ago and I actually thought that was the video Johnny was responding to. So that was why I was like, I'm not going to watch this. But then I realized this is a new video. And yeah, like Nate said, like, no one has really covered this, which I think is really strange because there's, like, what, fucking unlimited archives on Onision and things like that, Davi Vanity. I mean, you can find decades of fucking shit on that guy. Brian, like, I, allegedly has done, you know, I'm saying allegedly to cover my bases here, um, you know, a lot of similar fuck shit as those guys, um, you know, including... Including, I, I, you know, I'm never, I'm not gonna say like he crossed the threshold of sexual misconduct, but definitely weird shit, or like, like actually like um, SA, I should say rather. But he did just, just some of the weirdest, like towing the line of being creepy with minors for sure, especially Johnny. Like, you know, and I'm definitely interested to hear what he has to say because I've, I've known forever that Johnny was living with him when he was six, uh, 15, 16, but like, how the fuck did that, I don't know how that came to be. Brian Stars, full name Brian O'Dell, was born on May 22nd, 1990 in Sendai, Japan. So obviously Brian Stars is not Japanese, uh, but he lived in Japan because that- This is uh, all true, by the way. He was born in Japan and um, it's Blew because his family- I don't. I found that out. His family was like missionaries. Brian was very happy in Japan. In a Draw My Life video, he referenced this time as the happiest year- I never watched this. However, Brian's dream- I actually did watch Hawaii this, so short, and at the I've got that up on Johnny. Moved to Texas. Was, he didn't speak English fluently and wasn't super in touch with American culture. And honestly, it sounds like a really challenging thing to go through to be the curly-headed blonde kid who can barely speak English with a Japanese- Japanese accent and probably made him a super easy target overall and it must have been really challenging at such a young age and I, I do genuinely feel for him on that eventually it's you know it's really hard I'm gonna pause it here because I this is gonna sound really weird especially considering that I consider myself like pretty empathetic um I I hate to say that I never considered that fact um that that may have had you know a big impact in shaping who he was and, you know, the way that he uh, reacted to people and social situations as an adult and stuff like that. Um, but when I say the reason I've never thought about that is because in person, the man is like truly emotionless. I, I'm not a fan of like, I, of using of a just diagnosing other people and b you know, flagrantly using the word sociopath. But in my experience with him, the only thing that ever seemed to matter was money. And I was actually talking about this. I was talking about someone else in my personal life um, with my boyfriend and relating him actually to Brian. And I was saying, like, you know, this man was just stone cold stoic all the time, very calculated and um, 
mathematical and everything had a purpose for what he was doing, whether you were aware of it or not, um, and never had emotions unless it had to do with money. And as soon as money got involved, there was plenty of emotion. So um, I guess when I say like I never, I never, um, you know, really considered that as being a part of, you know, why he was so you know, having a, having a difficult childhood, he never talked about it. Like, you know, even knowing the man in person, he barely seemed like a person, I guess is what I should say. Like, it was just very, very odd. Like MDE would go out to eat. He never came with us. We would literally be hanging out in the living room, like with just a door between us and he would never come out and like talk to us or anything. It was very odd. Brian developed an interest in news and journalism. <laughs> in high school, he made a documentary about the energy crisis in America, where he won third place in a competition at his high school. This competition was hosted by C-SPAN, and Brian was given $1,000 and had his documentary broadcast on national television. When he went to college, he started doing an internship with NBC. Where he would I'm just so impressed by this guy getting all this part right. That's impressive. That's some deep dive shit. This is deep dive shit for shows. sure. Now, it, Brian shit. rose to prominence on YouTube because he interviewed, you know, bands in the emo scene, metalcore, hardcore, warp tour community. So I'm not going to go through every fucking interview he did, every subscriber milestone so and all that shit because it's unnecessary and it would take forever. But I do want to explain what these interviews were like if you weren't familiar. I'm also going oh, I'm to be familiar. You don't have to tell me. Based on how they were perceived at all. the time. Pretty much everyone loved him. And I'm personally of the belief that these a majority interviews were of the so band good. members genuinely genuinely enjoyed doing interviews with Brian. This Whether one was. They, were laughing they really him were. I liked him. I enjoyed him. to be determined, I was but a fan. they did enjoy it at the very least. But I watched tons of Brian Starr's interviews with Asking Alexandria, Black Veil Brides. Our boy! So this <laughs> is when, like, go. Ronnie, like, started falling in reverse. Like, he just got out of prison and shit. Yeah. Brian Starr's was a black sheep in the best way possible. I mean, look at him. The curly blonde locks, no tattoos, and that crusty, <laughs> unwashed, blue Aeropostale shirt. Brian embraced the fact that he was different. He asked ridiculous questions to the band members and I think the goal was to let the band members come out of their shell. The juxtaposition and the contrast between him and these band members was always so intriguing to me. Like the fact that a guy um, like Brian could, or at least his, you know, his persona at the time could become so enmeshed in a world that he seemed to like know nothing about. Um, and that was why when he developed MDE and like, you know, started becoming an emo kid of of his own accord it was so jarring because you know even from your guys's perspective you all knew that like he was to an extent faking it and like not to be a um an alternative gatekeeper or whatever but he went from this to wearing like only black veil brides merch trust me i i was there for months the same shirt every day um, <laughs> uh yeah and pretty much like that's it and doing the hair thing which you know, was destroying his hair and he hated doing and, you know, from an inside perspective, we knew it was all a front because he told us from your guys' perspective, you knew it was all a front because it was obvious. In a saturated market of band interviews that you had to break the mold a little bit, but for some reason, the only thing he could think of doing different was essentially sexually harassing the people. <laughs> it's interesting. I think like back then, especially so though, funny. like if you look at YouTubers like Shane Dawson and like Destry Smith, a lot of them, their content was based around sexual jokes and humor. And 100%. Shit. So he probably, in a way, got, like, the same kind of treatment where it was being praised. But now, looking back on it, it's like, fuck that. Yeah, it was, like, praised almost. It was rewarded. It's definitely the culture, and I think it's still, in part, the culture. Like, my last boyfriend, for example, um, not Seth, obviously, but my ex-boyfriend, who I was in a band with, um, you know, he exposed me to, he was a drum tech for some other bands in the scene, and he exposed me to a lot more of, like, what it's like just being on tour and, like, being around all these people, and, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a very, like, uh, safe for women culture, and I, and he took it a step further because he was mostly doing this to men, actually, so I guess it really doesn't matter. Like, to be arguably the most beautiful lead singer in the metalcore genre like he would say this to females too and no one knew he was like gay at the time even if he you know if they knew that it probably would still be weird he would be like what does it feel like to be the hottest girl on warp tour or whatever the most sexiest girl sometimes it was just like kind of off it was just weird it just makes it weirder that he was like sexualizing women when he's not even interested in women or they like, have any sexual feelings towards women because then he's just doing it for the sake of doing it you know what i mean which is like 
almost worse. Like there's no actual emotion behind it or des- desire, which I'm not, I'm not defending either way. I'm just saying it just makes it weirder, like just to sexualize someone for the sake of doing it. Like it's just fucking weird. Question is, if you were a porn star, what would your porn star name be? And what yes, would your Brian is gay, everyone. Be? Which is a funny, interesting question, I suppose, and a question that they probably wouldn't hear from any other interviewer. But a lot of his joke questions were kind of just like homoerotic and hypersexual. I guess the idea was to loosen the band members up so they could be that themselves was kind of and the be goofy. And it, it's a great idea, but I can think of tons though, of ways so. to ask I mean, weird questions without being fucking gay about it. I think the reason why he was super like sexual and gay about it was due to the fact of that just being the most rewarded thing when it came to the interviews, when people talked about it and everything. He was like, fuck, like, this is what people want more of. of. This is what is, like, making me seem different than the other interviewers. Let's take it to 100. That's exactly what I'm saying, though, is, like, the fact that it was, like, less of an actual, like, he gets um, enjoyment out of doing, you know, this fuck shit or whatever and, you know, making people feel uncomfortable and more so the fact that he's doing it just because of the numbers and the money. And that was what it always came back to, at least in my opinion from my experience, was, like, everything was money and numbers very calculated and cold again like i said like oh this type of content even though it's fucking weird and i don't get any personal enjoyment out of it it equals money it equals revenue so i'm gonna keep doing it yeah i've brought it up before but he like literally tried to wrestle while he was really drunk um and he would like purr on my neck and he went <laughs> and i was like what the fuck dude that was the weirdest thing he's ever done to me. 18 or so, I was like, that's fucked up. That's not, like, cool. That's weird. It was weird. And I was like, I don't want to wrestle you, dude. I'm a fucking adult. Like, what the fuck? Like, I wasn't an adult. I was a kid. I was, like, 18. But I was like, I don't... I'm too cool for that. Like, what the fuck, dude? The only other thing he did that was, like, obviously just super out of pocket was giving me drinks. And, like, he did this with other people as well. But he gave me drinks, I'll speak about, when I was 17 or so. And he would, like, give me drinks to the... Like, he would pour drinks and hand them to me. And I'd be like, I'm good. And he'd pour them and hand them to me. I want to elaborate on the the drinking thing because I feel like um, he he gave, you know, again, I guess I don't want to speak for anyone else. But since Johnny's already put it out there and, you know, I was not 21. I was definitely over 18. But he, you know, he supplied alcohol for all of us who ever wanted it. Um, it was uh for me, it was for me, it was of my own accord. I'll say that. I had already been drinking in my life, even though I was underage. That doesn't excuse him like buying the alcohol for us or whatever. But I, I will say, like, none of he would never like for me would put the drink in my hand, that type that type of thing. But um I spent a lot of time with all these people and there were a few nights in particular where I remember I'm pretty sure it was a Super Bowl Sunday. And we were in the studio and um it was me. Kyle, Johnny, um, my ex-boyfriend at the time, uh, Tyler, um, and Brian, and we were recording Brian's EP, and I remember this specific day that, um, you know, I don't want to go too in-depth because this is not, like, my story to share, but since I know he's kind of already talked about it, I just want to back up his claims. There was a day where Johnny really did not want to drink, and I, I, long story short, basically, like, every time Johnny would try to get rid of his drink, Brian would be right there with another fucking drink to, like, make him take drink it, and I, I remember Johnny specifically saying, like, I don't want to drink this, and he was like, come on, you're so lame, like, that kind of thing, just, I mean, the most, like, 90s drug PSA peer pressure that you can possibly think of, so... And that it ended up being a really bad night, and Brian did nothing to help. Everyone in the chat is saying, poor Johnny, and I completely agree, um, which is why when I showed up, I was like, yo, what the fuck is, I was like, this shit is not right, like, you know, there's been this arrangement for years, and like, Brian, you seem cool, like, or you don't seem cool, but you seem cool with the fact that you're taking advantage of everyone, and no one's, maybe people sort of feel weird about it, but no one's spoken up yet, which is why I was like, hey, yo! unionize my digital escape like this is not normal we cannot we cannot go on like this people um yeah but johnny definitely poor guy got got the the brunt of of brian's wrath for sure and and creepiness i guess well as the audience of these emos screamo post-hardcore whatever the fuck bands consisted of underage girls that were like 12 to 15 so the girls watching these videos they were fine with it they didn't see anything wrong with it and i didn't either i was around that age as well when i watched his videos but after hundreds of interviews it was only a matter of time before somebody snapped 
Christopher Drew is the singer for the band. Let's Never go, Shut my boy. <laughs> I love one of his him best so much. Interviews, even to this day. So much that the I'm New so York sorry, Times wanted to you, cover Chris. one of his interviews. And what better band to cover than Never Shout Never? Chris and Brian seemed to have great chemistry. The previous interview did really well, and people wanted another. It was perfect. That right? first, hey. that first interview. I'm not kidding. Like probably defined partially me, who I am today, um, which is just weird to say out loud. So. Yeah, I mean, it's so, the world is so small, guys, like, that I was one of those 14, 12, 13, 14-year-old girls, however old I was when that video came out, that was watching this, you know, wide-eyed, and so excited, in love with both Brian and uh, Christopher Drew, and, yeah, I mean, that shit made me who I am, I remember this, this interview, this, what we're looking at on the screen right now is burned into my retinas for the rest of forever, so... Hey, what's up, you guys? We're hanging out here with Never Shout Never. I think I heard about and like certain... And, like, for me as a kid, the first interview with Never Shout Never was a huge part as to why I became so, like, when I was young, I was like, ah, Christopher Bro. threw out the black marks on my face and the furry hat and shit. Dude, like, me and Johnny me are the same, same person. I love you, Johnny, so much. That's hilarious. 15 or so. So, um, Brian was, like, also a big reason of that. So, like, I was just as much of a fan and all that shit. Um, but this is the second interview, and this shit was That's so funny. Rough. Oh, that's and so I think, cute. I think for the most part, Brian was probably mistreated in this interview. I don't think it was cool still. As much as I still, like, never shall never and all that, I do think that Brian was mistreated in this. I do agree. I do feel like, you know, as much as I'm saying, like, let's go Chris, and I do love Christopher Drew. Like, I was so mad at him when this came out. I do feel like he should have just not done the interview um, and or done this whole situation in, an, you know, uh, I guess not nicer. There's not really a nicer way to say, like, your show is a joke, which is what he ultimately ends up saying. Um, but he should have just said, like, like, I'm not interested in those questions or whatever. And then when the cameras weren't rolling, been like, look, dude, I'm not comfortable. If you want to interview, interview me again, you need to, like, cut the shit or whatever. But, yeah, I mean... Definitely am not advocating for treating people poorly, especially face to face on the internet, whatever. But I, um, in retrospect, a lot of what Chris said really resonated with the things that he did to my digital escape to all of us as people later on, years down the line. So rewatching it sometimes, I'm like, yes, someone was on our side from day one. But um, no, I mean, I agree with Johnny. Like, obviously, should not have been such a dick about it. I guess. That we broke up. Uh, when are we gonna start talking about music? Cause that's what we're all about. Well, I'd like to start now. Let's see. No. No. We're not about any bullshit. We're just about. Really Someone said he probably did, but Brian edited it to be the victim. Peace, that's a good. Shot, never video. You are trying that's to make a, good, a mockery. Good point, chat. Possibly. Was I anti Chris when Brian made him cry? I don't. I don't remember honestly. I, I mean, was. I definitely was like bummed. I was pissed. I definitely was bummed and like thought it was rude, and I still think it's rude, and I, I still don't think it's okay. It's kind of frustrating to see how people view this video in modern times. People say things like, oh, Chris saw through Brian and we should have seen the signs ahead of time. Fuck that, okay? I'm going to be plenty critical of Brian in this video, but this is not I guess I'm kind of a bad opinion a and I, I, Dude, I, I really appreciate this person's perspective on it because this is completely how I see it as well. There's plenty of situations to be critical about Brian. The dude has done a lot of fucked up shit, but this was just not... This was, like, fucked up. Like... Sure, Brian could have asked more, like, you know, chill questions and stuff, but this was just not, like, his fault. Chris later went to Twitter and blamed being on acid during the interview as why he was such a dick, which, to be fair, I wouldn't be surprised if he was on acid because he was acting a little bit too. weird. Why the fuck would you take acid before an interview? That, that is I mean, really I think with the stupid. taking acid before an interview, I don't think it was necessarily his goal to take acid before an interview. I think he was probably just taking acid in general and was just not you know growing up that's and valid stuff. i wonder if this christopher drew interview never happened if brian would have uh gone down the same course like this this christopher drew interview shattered the the emo trajectory of the future like had that not happened i wonder if md ever would have came to be you know what i mean so it is like like these guys are saying i'm glad that they had a different opinion than me because you know, it is it really easy for me to say, like, oh, he saw through it all the time, uh, or he saw through him way back in the day, and he's, you know, we had someone looking out for us in the beginning, which it does, you know, kind of feel like that when I watched that interview, but in the same breath, um, he hadn't done any of the, sh he hadn't done anything yet, like, he hadn't done anything that we know of, you know, the Brian stars we know to of today, he was not that man yet. At the end of the interview, you can see Brian, like, 
visibly upset. He's crying. He's I cried with him when this came and out. I, I don't care. And this is when Brian Starr started to become like a celebrity in the scene, hardcore and emo community. In the behind the scenes footage for Brian Starr's interviews moving forward, he was constantly being approached by fans. People were so excited to see him and he was even getting chants from the crowds. Crazy. I think for me as like an outsider and stuff, the reason why I connected with Brian so much, he wasn't trying to be anyone else. But eventually he did try to be someone else. And I can understand why he felt the need to become someone else. But I I can say from my perspective and everyone else, we never wanted him to be trying to be someone else. I always wanted him to be Brian. I guess my perspective differs from Johnny in a sense that um, I met when I really met Brian, like as an equal and not as a fan uh he was already into the process of transitioning to this you know fake emo money grab whatever he was doing with the straight hair and the the you know the band shirts and everything that's that's why i am personally uh more harsh on the man i never got to know him as you know the friendly i guess friend friend version of brian that some of these guys did so in late 2012, Brian Stars was on top. He was doing interviews, and later he would announce his Brian Stars tour. So this gave people across the country the opportunity to, to meet their favorite the YouTuber. The so the tour itself Brian isn't Stars entirely tour. important to the story of Brian Stars, except for the fact that a certain person comes into frame, arguably the most important person in the story aside from Brian. Brian would hire a young man named Johnny Gilbert to run the merch stand for his tour. Johnny was Johnny, only 15 I years old at this time. Merch. Johnny was and is a good-looking guy. He's got the cute email soft boy look with the squirrel hat and the face paint and brian star's community like i said earlier was young teenage girls as you can girls, see i who love emo boys the, as you see in this clip of me i was quite the fan of christopher like, drew because i'm literally wearing the same <laughs> he exact has little christopher, as christopher drew. drew and He's doing calling the, him the, the fucking same be fucking bear hat so i was quite the christopher drew fan and friends with brian at the time it was very strange to mention but i eventually do film the uh, never shout never interview number three with brian and chris and so like little i would oh, say 18 wild. year old me is like holding the camera while they're talking it out and i'm like oh this is really fucking weird the community that is really fucking weird i didn't know that shit. my digital escape is a youtube channel created by brian star it was created by Let's me go. and brian the boys like <laughs> correction i lived with brian in nebraska so i made the trailer um which was the intro and it had like a shane dawson theme song super love found alex somehow, it was super love he found some members i found like alex and alex ramos jordan sweeto because jordan and i collabed in the past and then brian found uh kyle super love and um fuck who else was in the channel originally austin oh, jones. it was austin jones and brian also added austin jones i didn't know who austin jones was at the time johnny obviously like me as well as alex dorami Do okay i added alex Doram. i don't i don't fuck <laughs> Jordan Sweeto. I added Jordan. Kyle David Hall. Kyle was Brian. Well I think Ramos. Jordan was the Alex one who Ramos found was, me, though, uh, so me. God bless Jordan. Alex Ramos, that's the one I forgot. Alex Ramos was me. But the last original member, I can't find much trace of on the channel. This is somebody that I know you know. Another crucial player. Oh, yeah, and Austin Jones. Brian. Austin Jones was Brian. Brian Stars. None other than convicted sex offender, Austin. Well, I don't know why convicted I'm saying let's go to that. Sex offender. Oh. I have it. Sorry. My Digital Escape was a channel of seven That members. video is fucking horrible. This video. is the first time I met Kyle. Oh, Alex Ramos didn't stay for long. He wasn't good with uploading. So Alex Ramos, um, the reason why he got... He's he didn't stay in the channel. He posted about three videos and why he didn't stay in the channel is because Brian eventually did kick him out and it was just due to the uploads. He just didn't upload. He was I didn't you know, know that kind of I was not a part of the, all that the stuff. fam at this point. And so. uh, th therefore, like, you know, it was like, OK, you got to leave. But Alex Ramos took it well and stuff and was chill about it. And I don't know if he's he always seen really or chill. If he got the boot, but he was eventually replaced by Shannon Taylor and Jane Will and Shannon was out and yeah. And then Shannon and then Luke was replaced. Austin. For the record, I. I was not their replacement for um for Alex. I believe that Luke was probably I don't know this for a fact, so I'm just saying I believe that Luke was the replacement for Alex Ramos. And then uh, like a month down the line when um the twerking uh twerk gate came to be, uh that was when I was added to the channel. And that was by Brian wanting to take money from me and Jordan lovingly finding me on the internet. We had collabed before in the past, so. 
Jones early on in the channel, or maybe it was the other way around. I really don't know. It's hard to figure out this information with all the deleted videos and lack of archives. MVE's content was pretty mediocre. It certainly wasn't <laughs> to you. I thought it was really fucking cringe. I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was dog shit. Could have been good. There was potential for it to be good, and there was yes, good there moments. Yes, there was. But yeah, Austin. much Austin Jones got called out originally for twerking videos. It was not Twerk known gate. that he was asking minors for butthole videos, which is disgusting. But it was right. not we known didn't know that. that for a it while. was just known that he was asking for twerking videos of minors. So that's already fucking weird, but it's not illegal, I don't think. I don't know. So they kind of wrote it off, and Austin made an apology. But during when Austin made an apology, and he was already managed by Brian's uh, management called Talent Shop, which managed all the members of MDE except uh, Luke at the time. Made the apology, and then we eventually were like, we can't be in a channel with Austin, dude. Like, this is, like, weird. Like, even, like, me as a kid, I was, like, I was probably 17 or 18. I was like, I, this is weird, bro. Like, I don't want to be. This is, like, this is sexual enough. Austin left the channel, and then we added uh, Luke in the channel, who I was a fan of since I was a kid. His hair out, straightened it, and he even traded Oh, dude, Jordan, like... Jordan's in the background. Uh, this <laughs> was, like, a hot topic. I do believe, I do truly luke was 100 percent a part of the channel before i was so i do believe that luke was the replacement for alex i know for a fact that i was the final the final piece of the puzzle that came in um uh, when austin got kicked or left or whatever so yeah around this is when i come into the picture here review during warp tour and this is when brian started doing his hair and i would try to i really did try to help him sometimes i also felt really uncomfortable about it but i would try and alex i remember even like tried to help we would like try to straighten his hair and cut it the way i cut my hair and stuff, i was like it just felt really weird and like his hair is naturally curly you can't really Why do much even so, if you're getting like, like treatment and for it and sweet. stuff you just you can't being emo was all about being different but ironically the nerdy kid wearing an aeropostale shirt was what was different in that community he was kind of put into a box where he felt like he had to wear the aeropostale shirts he had he to keep his hair short Feel that way so i understand him wanting to break free of that mold but it seemed like it was a business move and you'll learn why i think it definitely was um at least at like some point when he started doing his music, it definitely became a business move. That as we watch Brian, look one hundred percent, and I have insight on the the EP for something sure. Something happened in between the inception of my digital escape and the fall, and it may be potentially the worst thing Brian has ever done. I'm sure you know the story, but I'm just gonna go over it real fucking quick. But from the perspective of Brian Stars, essentially Austin Jones was a YouTube-based pop star, very talented, very cool, very swag. I don't like it. Because Austin was exposed for attempting to solicit explicit pictures from underage girls around 14 to 15 years old. Austin would also give them twerking tutorials. Oh my god, I haven't watched this in so long. This shit's so weird. Hey cuties. And also, I'll say like, this. Uh... Austin Jones had access to My Digital Escape's Twitter at the time because he was a member. And we were on Warp Tour. And I, I was forgot about this. Everyone because they like visited. And Austin took my digital escapes twitter when we like we weren't like wanting to be in a channel with him anymore and he tweeted austin jones should kill himself and then deleted it so everyone that had notifications which it was very popular at the time yeah uh saw it and dude. they thought that we tweeted austin jones should kill himself genuinely. dude i remember this we were all together i don't know if it was warped or what as far as i remember it was all seven of us were together um and I remember I, you know, I was logged into my Hey There, I'm Shannon Twitter account. I remember getting the fucking notification that said, and I had just joined MDE too, sitting on the bus with all these motherfuckers, like that I had just met some of them for the first time. Get the notification from our own account. Uh, fucking Austin Jones should kill himself. And we all looked at each other like, you know, what the fuck? Like, we were like, did someone in here do this? But we traced the IP and, um, Brian traced the IP. He was good for some things like that and uh, found it was from o Ohio, I believe, is where Austin lived at the time. And it like like we had his address. Brian had his address because, you know, we fucking work together. Tax document shit of that nature. We know where he lives and he didn't use a VPN or anything and just god damn that is some fucking maniacal ass shit austin jones should kill himself who is that crazy that they tweet that about themselves like i don't know genuinely like, he literally tried to that? frame us for saying that he should kill himself but none of us did that and for some reason brian and all of our management told us not to tweet about it and call him out which i think we should have honestly yeah but we what just the never fuck said was that anything. about and we just kind of took heat for that instead of i totally forgot about that why what the hell oh you know why you know why i think it was was at this point in time i truly believe that um allegedly 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 
I think that Austin, even after I was a part of my digital escape, I believe that Austin was still a part of talent shop management, which is Brian's management company with, um, you know, he had a partner, a manager partner as well. That was also our manager. Um, I, from what I understand, allegedly, he was still under their management. So I totally forgot about this. Um, yeah, I remember being so confused when they were like, don't tweet about it. Don't let our fans know that it wasn't us. I was like, so like, we just take the blame for telling this guy to kill himself? And they were like, yeah, pretty much. I bet you had no idea that when you met me just one day later, you get to show me your butthole. How special do you feel? Dude, what okay, is wrong? go make a clap out and talk about your age the whole time. Got it? Yeah, it's it's yeah he literally disturbing. like. Talk about your age the whole time. Oh my god! That's the so worst he was part. literally getting off on the fact that they would say that they're underage. Austin Jones, wonder what he's doing now. He's in jail. I was just like, oh, my Ten sister's years, dead. I don't know my dad, and my house caught on fire, and I cut myself, and my life is tragic, and that's why I'm sexting minors and fucking twerking on camera. Fuck you, Austin. That's not even a good reason to be. I mean, it's not funny, like but that was a great story. Uh, <laughs> Austin was set to go on the Vans Warp tour with Brian, Johnny, Jordan, Austin, and D Fizzy, who was also very crucial to the story. Yeah. Yes. Man's Warp Tour, by the way, is like a staple experience of any emo or hardcore kid. It's like a coming of age thing. Me and Alex uh, did hear about some of this shit. I don't remember exactly. I think Alex had a friend, and that friend brought up Austin Jones being creepy to towards them. So Alex brought that up to Damon. Then Damon like already had some stuff that was brought up to him in the past um, about Austin. And so it was all brought up to Damon. He was the more, you know, he was the adult in the situation. We were still pretty young. And um, I kind of, you know, was part of, like, you know, we all, like, Brought it up, and then we eventually brought it up to Brian while he was on his computer, fucking vaping and doing stocks. And <laughs> oh my god, another and he flashback! He kind of dismissed it and like didn't really care or take it seriously. When it did come down to it, Damon was a huge, like he was the biggest part of why this actually, you know, got Game fucking busted be. and everything. And like he, did this is all a refresher for me. Correct, I barely he remember got this. Shitted on. I became a part of this like unit after this all went down, and I wasn't really following it super closely at the time because my channel was also taking off. I was very new to like the scene in general, and I just I had a lot on my plate. So this is all going to be kind of a refresher for me, like the actual how he got exposed. On tour with him, there was tons of underage girls at Warp Tour, and he didn't want to be in a bus with a pedophile. He called all of it out, and he got kicked off of Warp Tour, and was Which called a bully. And people were saying that he was slandering Austin Jones True. for calling out Austin for asking That's for insane. butthole pictures of minors and asking them for twerking videos. It's True. it's fucking insane. But at the end of the day, from it's what soft, I remember, man. neither Austin or Damon ended up on the tour. This is like the beginning of like degeneracy in the scene too. So it was, I feel like this is one of the first biggest examples because people weren't getting called out because every time, you know, someone such as Damon, for example, would do this like bring attention to a situation kind of like i was saying at the very beginning of this stream uh people's attitudes are very much like if you bring up a situation um then you're the problem because as long as you're quiet we can ignore it you know what i mean like i feel like that's very much people's attitudes so you know like damon for example comes out and says hey this guy is literally like he is now in fucking prison rotting in prison for 10 years for his actual crimes Damon is like, hey, this guy's committing crimes. And people's reaction is like, shut up. We don't have to pay attention to that if you just don't bring it up. Like, just let him commit his crimes in private and then we don't have to be uncomfortable about it, was very much the attitude. And, um, you know, God bless God bless Damon because he seriously was a huge uh, proponent, proponent of making, you know, or bringing all of these uh, allegations out of the woodworks and making the scene a safer place. Um, he really got the ball rolling. So we'll always say Damon's Damon's a good man. So is Johnny. And that Brian was in Austin. Also, Jones thank you for the dono, JT. Giving him advice on how to get out of this. Brian was Austin Jones's manager, and when correct. Damon okay, so I was right. I was right. Allegations. He brought him up to Brian, and Brian very quickly changed the subject, which I don't know how the fuck you pivot out of a conversation like that, but a good job, Brian. He didn't care if minors were getting groomed or even assaulted. He just wanted the commission he'd get from Austin Jones and the money he'd make from Warp Tour. But yeah, maybe you didn't know that. That's actually, that's completely true. That is completely true. And I have another situation. Um, just this is kind of like a personal tangent for me a little bit here. Um, but moving on down the line, like just t taking a pause from this saga here. 
years late, not years later, but like a year or two later, um, I was dating a guy who, uh, you know, allegations were brought up against him and I, you know, helped spread those because there was plenty of photo evidence and obviously we broke up and everything. Well, I'm not even going to say this guy's name, but this guy, this YouTuber who was in the scene, who had these allegations and that I broke up with because of it in part, um, Brian, like, came to know about him through our breakup and our, like, it was very, like, vitriolic, like, lots of back and forth on the internet. I mean, he basically harassed me for, you know, months after we broke up because he was upset about it. Um, he also was cheating on me in the beginning of our relationship. So like, I mean, it actually like, and the only reason I found out was because that girl assaulted me, like whatever, that's a whole nother situation. Um, Brian finds out about this guy. This guy comes across his attention because, you know, it's blowing up on the internet and he fucking signs him or at, I'm sorry, he didn't, let me, let me get my story straight. He wrote out a contract and sent it to him to be signed. Because I found out about it, the guy, my ex, never actually signed the contract um, because he knew that was going to be us being on the same management company, especially with all the allegations and everything, was going to be an issue. But it was like, Brian knows about this guy because another person on his management is being tormented by them. And he's also got these crazy allegations, and all he saw was the dollar signs and sent him that contract. Rise and fall would actually include the rise and fall of one of the most prominent sexual predators in YouTube history. I mean, this guy is arguably worse than EDP, and Brian was in his ear the whole time. Yeah, I agree. The safety of his own fans for money, but it keeps getting crazier. Apparently, an associate of Brian's management company named Dan was with Austin Jones. This is how I know this guy knows his shit, because Dan... I'm not going to say his last name. I'll be nice enough. You, you know. Yeah, it is but crazy Dan that he knows who was, Dan is. Yeah, it was Brian and Dan. They were the managers of Tan Talent Shop. Was fucking I only met Dan once, for the record, and he flew out. The reason I met him was because they weren't feeding us on the tour. Um, we were supposed to be getting a uh, per diem every day, which is basically the money that you get to live to, like, $20 a day to go eat and shit like not very much money but we didn't have any money like we were kids and Brian like you know lassoed us all up together and put us on a bus most of us didn't have like savings or anything um so we relied on that $20 to go fucking get our food and shit and we weren't getting it we were not receiving it no one was giving us the money so we like some of us just weren't eating and like you know Jordan for example is from Australia his cards and stuff didn't work in America um so and for some reason, this was not an issue we could figure out uh, in in person or, you know, over the phone or whatever. So Dan actually flew out. And that's the only time I ever met my other manager. But it is crazy that this guy knows knows that part of the lore to the in an airport right True. before he was sentenced to a minimum of 10 years in prison prison. I didn't Brian know that stars tried to cover the tracks of a felon and registered sex offender. I did but not, not know that about to overlook the abuse of his fans. He even did it to his own friends. All of the members of the aforementioned My Digital Escape would join forces, all in the same room, for a week of content called 7 for 7 Week. According to one of the members, Shannon, Brian ruled with an iron fist. No one was allowed to come up with ideas for the content. We're going to do the fucking leaf blower challenge. I, was a I remember the leaf blower challenge. I'm sorry for screaming. Everyone's ears are blown out. Um, he did roll with an iron fist, and I remember the leaf blower challenge specifically because this was a day after a day that he... Uh, held a notorious party or, you know, rather got all of his underage employees drunk uh, in his apartment. Um, we were fucking wasted the night before. I mean, at least I was. Not everyone was. Just, you know, I was. Let's just say that. And so the next day when we were going to film this fucking leaf blower challenge, I was literally so hungover, like probably more hungover than I've ever been in my life. And I remember being like, can we do this another day? And he was like, no, get in the car. Get in the car. I mean... Brian is so lucky I didn't puke in his fucking car that day. That's not that. That is literally not the worst. The leaf blower challenge is fine. It was more so when we started playing fucking board games and shit and just talking about cocks when we were fucking underage <laughs> and had accurate. no experience with cocks. That's accurate. It was fucking weird. So according to Shannon, Brian told all the members one day that they had to film a video about depression. Had True. to film a video. Shannon True. referenced this as selling suicide, which definitely... Yeah, and Brian's known for selling suicide I because I even remember um, my first video that actually got popular, like, was unintentional, but it was about me, like, 
struggling and I was like a young kid and I lived with Brian at the time. As were many of my I, uh, videos. I was early talking about on. how I was suicidal and I was struggling with it. And my dad passed away and that was a big reason as to why I was, you know, fucking struggling. I was lost and I felt hopeless. And then Brian made this shirt called Self Love and Self Harm crossed out. And I was like, bro, this feels really gimmicky. And even as a 17 year old, I was like, this is fucked up. Yeah, we were all, for the record, Johnny was the first one. Johnny was actually very vocal about a lot of this shit, I will say. Like, um, even before I was like, yo, like, let's fucking shut this bitch down. Um, He, yeah, he was definitely one who was like, yo, like, you probably shouldn't sell that shirt. And I do remember Brian completely passing him off. That's also obviously fucked up because a lot of the people in my digital scape deal with depression and they didn't want to talk about it because they had to or for money they wanted to talk about it when they were in the proper headspace and felt like there was things to say about it a lot of fucked up things happened in that channel like that were like way too overly sexual and it's uh not cool it's pretty much what mde's humor was there was jokes about different male members having a secret gay relationship and they would click <laughs> kissing videos and all this different shit that so i'm not gonna sit it, here sure. and act like queer baiting is like the biggest atrocity ever uh but it's fucking cringe and so is no that's that's base it's not the biggest atrocity but it is fucking cringe absolutely i agree that's something as a kid i was just like kind of fed it was like oh this is what gets you popular keep on queer baiting yeah i mean like everything was very very carefully orchestrated and like johnny said it was kind of fed to us and yeah sure like as 17 18 year olds we all went along with it and like didn't really question anything um at the time because again our ultimate goal was you know uh I mean, not ultimate goal, but like, you know, we did want the channel to grow and everything. So we were like, sure, we're going to listen to our manager. And um, yeah, definitely was thought out by someone. It was not an organic thing that like just happened. Constantly making sex jokes with people that are as young as seven years your junior and barely legal. In fact, while I'm on the subject, some MDE videos featured Kyle and Johnny when they were under 18 reenacting things that I'm personally not comfortable with showing. And if you know my content, it should be very shocking that I'm I'm not willing to show whatever the fuck they Damn. were doing. For yeah, that is, sakes, he forced Johnny is, and uh, Alex to have fuck. their first kiss on camera True. when they were minors and they weren't even dating yet. And their first it's fucking ass too. And everyone roasted me about it. And then I made out with her for like five minutes on you now eventually. And it was also fucking cringe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing I had no idea about until, um, you know, later down the line, I, so when Johnny and Alex were, uh, like, getting together and everything, I'm pretty sure that was in the timeline, like, right before, or maybe it was right after, I think it was right after I joined MDE, um, I still never met them, I'm sorry if my timeline's kind of wrong, this is so, there's so much information to process and be processed, but I remember that video coming out, like I said, I think I had just joined MDE, but had never met them yet, and I remember thinking it was so cute, um, I liked the video and everything. Uh, that video fucking blew up. And I I had no inclination until uh, years later that Johnny told me that that entire thing was, like, legitimately set up. And I don't know why, like, I never – that never occurred to me. Um, but, yeah, I mean – and actually, that's not the only instance of Brian forcibly – I don't want to say forcibly, but manipulating people into a relationship um, – I'm sure Johnny's going to say something about him and Alex, but from what I understand, you know, and I'm not going to speak for them. From what I understand, long story short, on their part of things was he definitely, you know, coerced that relationship to happen for views and everything. But um, something I've never really talked about, uh, or maybe I have, but it's probably buried somewhere on the Internet, is the fact that when I dated Tyler, um, many of you guys probably remember this, the way that Tyler and I met, Tyler was also a member of Talent Shop Management. He was also managed by Brian. The way that Tyler and I met was Brian asked me to fly out to LA and play the female love interest in his um, music video. I never met Tyler. I didn't know anything about him. I I had never met, actually, I don't think a lot of them yet. Um, That was my first time meeting mostly everyone in MDE, I believe. Maybe it was my second time. I don't know. Regardless, semantics doesn't really matter. He flew me out there to be the the love interest in this video, right? Off, you know, people do that shit all the time. It's acting. It's whatever. However, once I got there... Brian was very adamant on setting up situations where Tyler and I would be alone. He really wanted us to kiss in the video. Um, That was something that I said I was comfortable with, 
But, like, that was kind of the end. Tyler was dating someone else named Billy at the time. Billy is a sweetheart and, like, the cutest, cutest girl ever. Um, Tyler was dating this girl, Billy, and the reason Tyler and I didn't want to kiss was because he was dating another girl. And, um, you know, YouTube's a little different than, like, you know, Hollywood music video productions. People take the person, like, the parasocial relationships a little too far, and we figured people would get really mad, um if we kissed in the video, but Brian did not want to let that idea go. He wanted us to kiss so bad. So I don't think we ever did it because Billy didn't want Tyler to do it either, which is completely understandable. I would have been the same way if I was his girlfriend at the time. Um, so when then when Billy got, you know, upset and was like, please don't do that or whatever. And Brian kept, you know, begging. Her, I think he actually went and talked to Billy and was like, please let this happen with Shannon and Tyler and all this stuff. It'll be great for views and his, his career and everything. I, I could be make, making that part up, making that memory up. However, I do know he at the very least got Tyler to be like, please let me do this kiss scene or whatever. Um, then after Billy was like, no, that's fine. I'm like, I'm putting my foot down, which again, completely understandable. Brian came up to us and was like, don't you think Billy's such a bitch? Like, don't you think, like, you should be with a better girl, like, someone who's more your style and, like, obviously implying me and all this stuff? And, you know, many a situation was created again for the two of us to be uh, alone and, like, be in a relationship and stuff like that. So, again, like, it's not like he ever was like, you two need to date for content. But it was very much, like, in retrospect, was that calculated? Like, did he know what he was doing? Because it seems a little too, uh, I don't know, just with the stuff he did to Johnny and Alex, it seems a little too, there's no such thing as a coincidence. YouTube video. That's all I'm so as say. you can guess, 7 for 7 week ended in disaster. No one wanted to That's be sweet. there. In fact, Shannon says, 7 out of 7 week was the first time that I realized there were huge problems. Shannon just seemed a lot more clear-minded during this situation than I was. Like, a thousand percent. I was not this clear-minded. I was fucking like, Brian's my friend. Brian is like someone I looked up to. And I've been living him with for years and stuff. And so I was like, ah. 7 out of 7 week. So, again, and that kind of goes back to, like, and, and Johnny, like, it was so much harder of a situation for him because he, like he said, he had been living with this guy and, like, been good friends with him. When I showed up, Brian was already into this, like, descent into madness, into emo psychosis, um, where he was doing the hair straightening and everything. And he was deep into his relationship with Johnny. Um, when I say relationship, just, like, as his manager and as his friend and everything. And, um... You know, the, I don't want to say, like, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but the weird patterns of, you know, manipulation and borderline abuse and stuff, I could see those as soon as I walked in. And I think everyone else had been, like, around this bubble as it was developing. And then here I was, like, coming into the timeline, cutting into the timeline, and I was the one who was like, whoa, like, you know, this, he, for lack of a better word, he has groomed you all to feel like this is normal and this is how things should be. Um, but I'm, you know, I've been thrust into this world now and this is wrong. Like, this is not okay. And, you know, that's why I was kind of, uh, kind of disliked from day one, at least by management, for sure. Everyone literally was just like this is not okay this is weird these videos are the stuff True. that we're making on our own time especially like jordan jordan spoke up a lot about it too jordan was very uncomfortable with a lot of these videos with when it comes to brian later down the line of mde they would embark on a tour much like the brian stars tour only one problem no one was ready for it nobody <laughs> had a say on whether this tour happened or not other than no. brian Brian forced these guys to go on tour across the country. What made it worse is that not all of them made music, but they all had to do a performance, which yeah. apparently was really stressful and difficult to deal with. Plus, Brian was taking 20% of every single member's income and forced to sign a contract to Talent Shop, which is his label, management, whatever the fuck. Otherwise, he was not going to allow him to be on the tour with us. No yes. one wanted to be on the tour. That's actually very true. That's another thing I forgot about was Luke, I'm pretty sure, was the only one who was not signed to Talent Shop at the time. And I remember this was actually, I think, a big part of the reason that we were like, we don't want to go on this tour. Like, there was a mention in the group chat. We had a Facebook group chat. Um, I think there was a mention of, like, why don't we just not do this yet? Um, because Luke was not ready to sign 
with Brian and Talent Shop, and obviously we're not gonna fucking do the MDE tour without all of MDE, like, that's, you know, fucking stupid, um, and, you know, we were actually friends, like, we were, you know, we were actually, the six of us were actually good friends with each other, and we were like, um, you know, yo, we're not doing this without, without fucking Luke, dude, like, so, no, that was the first time that I think it came up that we should just not do the tour, and then the second time that I'm pretty sure it came, uh, came up that we should not do the tour was when we got the original ad mats, which is, you know, the flyer for the tour. And it was like Brian stars and Johnny Gilbert in giant letters. And then the rest of us were in like tiny baby letters at the bottom. And I remember Kyle, I'm pretty sure it was Kyle was like, uh, it's a really sweet MDE poster, dude. I'm so glad the rest of us are going on tour too. Like, so there were multiple instances where people, Kyle and or other people were like, yeah, no, like, maybe we should take a pause, take a pause and rethink this whole thing. You know what I mean? Tour. Like I, I, the idea of touring was cool, but I only had my first EP out. I was 18 years old or so. And I didn't even know how to play guitar very well. Eventually Brian did actually, um, I don't remember if he like, he like tried to hit me apparently at one point when I was like 18, because I was like, Brian, you can't be a manager and a fucking member. You know, you're taking 20% of everyone's income. And then you're also trying to be a member and you're getting your own income. And then we have the My Digital Escape merch. And it just, with that income as a member and a manager and stuff, it just got really messy and everyone was uncomfortable with it. And then Brian, like, wanted to hit me at one point and shit. But, um, like, he literally, like, tried to do it. I I don't remember. I, I remember who saw it, but I, I didn't even remember story. it happening. But, like, yeah, apparently that happened. Everyone lost their shit. I think he could. So, okay. So I was not actually physically there for the beginning of this story. We were already on tour when um, I I was going to maybe not tell this story because I wasn't sure if Johnny had said this, but since he's talking about it, I guess I'll go into it. Um, I was at dinner. It was me, Kyle, um, Tyler, who the fuck else? I don't know. Um, I think Luke as well. Everyone, pretty much everyone but Jordan, Johnny, and Alex, and Brian. So the rest of us were all at dinner. And we got a text from Jordan that was like, you guys need to get back here, like, fucking now. Like, immediately, you guys need to come back to the bus. We're like, yo, what's up? And basically, the only information we got was, Brian is going to hit Johnny. And we were like, okay, fuck yeah, give us the bill. We're out. We're going to go. We're going. We're going to the bus. Um, And like I said, we were all actually friends. Like, the six of us had each other's back. So we were like, fuck no. Like, you know. If, if anyone's going to fucking fight Brian, it's going to be me, was pretty much what happened. So I guess when I wasn't there, like I said, this is the part I can't really speak on because I wasn't there. I guess when, before I got back to the bus, Brian was like up in Johnny's face. They were having the discussion that Johnny was talking about. Like, you can either manage us or be one of us. You can't do both. And he basically went to go hit Johnny. That's when I got the text. We came back. We were back within 10 minutes. I'm not kidding. This was probably one of the craziest nights in my life. Um, Brian got drunk while we were all talking to him. The conversation started off level-headed, but it escalated and escalated. And I don't know if he knows this, but one of us, not me, um, but somebody recorded this whole conversation. So there is a recording of it out there. Um, I don't know where. I'd have to find it. I'm sure I have a copy somewhere in the depths. But it was about four hours of Brian getting, you know, more drunk, getting more angry, um, basically saying, like, airing all of our personal financial uh, situations and stuff like that. And long story short, it ended up with 90% of the night, you guys are going to laugh at this, um, 90% of the night I spent on the fucking, uh, the, the, uh, what is it called, a bench of the the bus literally standing on it talking to Brian like this because I was so mad like I was like getting up just like oh oh and then I would be like in his face like no no because he was yelling at us like I said he had almost hit Johnny already I was in defensive mode bro I had that whole conversation that four-hour conversation from the top of a bench literally like uh two weeks before the tour happened brian released his ep his own ep so he could have it for the tour for the record tyler wrote that entire ep um and just like expanding on the fact that it was just for money like he literally when he gave tyler the parameters to write this ep what he gave what he gave him was um 
like like five different lines that were like the cringiest like let's go fucking crazy tonight that's one he actually gave him he's like i need you to write an entire song around let's go fucking crazy tonight because that is the that's the selling hook line like that's the the hook that's gonna make us the big bucks so i was privy to watch that entire album be written um it's a great time and you know i will obviously tyler and i have our differences he did what he could, man. He made that as good as he could. You know, he's he's a pretty good songwriter, and he he didn't have much to work with, so. Hurt everyone. Brian Zenz. He didn't he didn't fire everyone. He fired Kyle and Shannon because they were the uh, two that were having the most like, dude, stop, dude, you know, they were coming at him, which is understandable, and they were in the right for that. Video with Johnny and Alex announcing the end of My Digital Escape. Which Ryan's was news and, to me, because, like, uh, he said The reason fired. why this video was so awkward is, um, well, one, it was just shitty. I was sad. I felt, like, so fucking stressed, and I already had so much anxiety, and I, I still do. I feel so do. bad for him. Uh, but um, Brian, during this time, brought up the idea of, like, we should add Chris O'Fleen to replace Kyle. And we should add this person to replace this person. And I was like, what? Like, instantly? Like, you can't just replace me. <laughs> like, these are like, isn't it more than that? It was so weird. Most talkative. I wonder why. Maybe it's because he had the most to gain. And Johnny still looks had so sad. As opposed to Alex and Johnny, who had pretty much the only thing in their life taken away from them. And I need to stress this. They were fired right after being essentially kidnapped and financially abused into doing this tour. So it makes sense that they were insanely fucking depressed and bummed out. I mean, they barely want to look at the camera. And Johnny just doesn't have, like, the spunk in his voice that he normally does. It's it's fucking sad. But at it least sad. It's all And weird. I remember this video just blind inside of me entirely because i didn't know that they were gonna break up i just got fired and i was like well shit i mean i don't know what to do now i was like um you know at least i still have my own channel which was fine i wasn't too like upset but i my main concern after i got fired with kyle was like is he gonna keep doing this to the rest of them like are the rest of them going to just you know see me and kyle as the bad guys continue on with mde replace us immediately and then just be stuck in this cycle and that was really what i was worried was gonna happen so over these guys can put brian in poor the past, johnny right <laughs> it right. is poor johnny i feel bad new my digital escape 2.0 Featuring that guy who plays Apex Legends now. <laughs> there, there we go. Women that aren't his girlfriend. And. <laughs> Dude, what a fucking. This is this is true. I've seen the My Digital Escape 2.0 lineup. So the My Digital Escape 2.0 lineup, because Alex and I eventually dipped out of it and we were like, Brian, we're not going to be in this channel with you. Brian eventually moved into the same apartment as me and Alex. Which me is and so Alex weird. moved into our own because I was like, dude, I want to live with my girlfriend uh, alone, take it further. Um, and also. I just I need to get space from you because I don't like the way you're viewing things. Um, so I moved out of Brian's. I paid the last month of rent and I moved to Anaheim. He uh, moved into the same place eventually. That's moved there so because he weird. wanted to kind of I don't know try to weasel his way back into my like you know group me. I think mostly. Um, I mean I okay so I know obviously like Johnny sees this as like weird and everything, but I personally think that everyone's underplaying how fucking weird that is. I think that is like scary personally like if i if i had a falling out with a friend and then they moved i moved cities over and they moved into the same apartment building as me that would really like fuck me up i would be really upset about that so i i'm surprised that was never like uh addressed further or like you know i mean like i said johnny's a really good guy and would never like blow this shit up unnecessarily but that really rubs me the wrong way personally it never happened but uh, he definitely tried to. And during that time is when he filmed the first video for My Digital Escape 2.0, which never actually happened. But they did film one video for it, which was I didn't the trailer. Know that. And it was with Eugenia Cooney, Social Repose. Maybe I didn't know that. Who were like my friends, you know, and Diego. And it was also filmed with uh, Danny Edge, who was in um, Exclamation Point, which was a popular channel back then. Oh, yeah. And also featured on MDE back oh, in the day. Oh, yeah, they did and, put um, that out. Okay, Robbie. I remember that. Oh, yeah, and Chris O'Flynn was also a part of it. I forgot about him. It was such a wild thing. And I was like, why did you think this was – it would have been one thing if he literally made a new channel and was like, hey, I'm going to try to do it again. We would have just laughed at it. But trying to right. take our channel and be like, hey, I'm going to – 
do this. It was like, fuck, bro. Members. But a big part of the backlash yeah, was after Johnny, Alex, and Shannon made videos speaking out about this. And this is where, like, all the information about Brian being a shitty person kind of came to light. I watched all three of these videos, and I'm going to try to give the best song. So, like, the reason why my video about this and Alex's video probably weren't the best also is because, like, at least for myself, I was still wanting to be friends with Brian, like maybe not to the full extent, but I like I dude, he was like my best friend. You know what I mean? Like he really was like seeing like that shit fall yeah, apart. So we had hard. like our own like little skit show together called Johnny and Brian and it fucking, you know, like seeing all that shit just fall apart. I was like this. I don't want it to like fall apart forever. Brian was threatening to sue them at this point. Yeah. Brian didn't it's want it. It's so hard. I feel I do truly feel so bad for Johnny. And I think that's why, like, uh, I think that's why I was always like the warrior with this, this whole situation was because I knew these other guys had a personal connection with him and like saw him fall from grace. Whereas I had only met him as the fallen. And I just, I didn't have that, that empathy for him that these guys had. Like I never, I never knew him as nice guy, Brian. I only knew him as the guy who was taking advantage of, Mainly Johnny and, you know, yeah, it fucking sucked. I've never been one to be able to, like, watch someone else, uh, I don't know, take advantage of someone else. That's, that's really it. And if we've learned anything from this video, slandering is when you tell the truth. In summer, True. three Correct. former members said that Brian viewed them as tools. They weren't friends. They were just dollar signs. Even saying it was like working in a factory. Shannon mentions those things I mentioned earlier about the queer baiting and the hypersexual content. She even says that the analytics showed that the average viewers for MDE were 12 to 15 year old girls. So that's not good stuff to be showing them. The theme of these Definitely. videos were we were treated like shit. We were not valued. Brian squeezed us dry. He dumped us off. And then once the dust settled, he started a brand new channel with new people. Or it wasn't yep. even a new channel. It was the same channel. Just the emo farm. With different members. And they weren't allowed to do anything about it because Brian owned 100% of the channel. But imagine being in your late teens, being treated like a factory worker, having limited creative freedom, sacrificing working on your own channel, being degraded and humiliated, being dragged onto a tour and being bullied by a guy way older than you, all for you to be dumped out like you're trash. It's fucked. It's... It's completely fucked up. Point. It wasn't looking good for Brian. Brian released an apology. It was fuck. He actually released two apologies, um, because I watched them live and everyone else did as well. But Brian released one apology. He didn't think it was good enough, so he took it down. Then he released another apology, and in my eyes, that just made it seem way more fake. From what I remember, is the first apology. Brian is like crying profusely throughout the whole thing, which I shouldn't laugh at that, but obviously it was not genuine. Um, I remember, I, I'm pretty sure the first apology he cried through and then he deletes it because nobody gave a shit and put up the second one, which was way more like political and thought out and like scripted and such. And he was not crying, but it was just, the whole thing was so sus. Like I said, the man does not have a genuine bone in the, in his body. 100%. Yeah, someone says apology 2.0, <laughs> lol. That was what it was. At the lowest point of your career, what can you possibly do to fix things? My name is Brian, and I am gay. Raise up that marginal shield of yours, Brian. <laughs> Hi, you guys! I, I shouldn't laugh at this, because this is genuinely, like, this is the one thing where I saw, when, when Brian did this, I felt, I had empathy for him. I felt really bad. I mean, I always, I always try to have empathy for everyone, but... I, I, this was the time when I was like, dude, this, this poor motherfucker, like, I know he somewhat deserves this, but when he came out as gay, um, it was the only time in YouTube fucking history that I ever, ever saw the reactions to a coming out video, especially, like, if you, several years ago like that, when it was, like, a big form of content online, and people were taking that shit very seriously, and, like, you know, everyone was very welcoming of these coming out videos and stuff. It was the first coming out video I ever saw where people were like, fuck you, I don't care. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I did feel bad for him. That's just a testament, like, the, to how bad you fucked up when you can post a coming out video and, like, the all the top comments are, fuck you, I don't care. At this point, all he could do was his least popular content, which was talk about news in the scene, which was pretty hard to scrape together into a consistent schedule. And his final video was uploaded today, five years ago, Rest in December peace. 18th. I forgot he tried to make more content. <laughs> the reason I wanted to do this is because I wanted to, you know, have, like do something with my life.
and people have told me that my videos help them get through a bad day and um, you know I wanted to, just wanted to do something cool with my life it is sad because he sounds genuine there and unfortunately I never got to meet that version of him so you know it's it's, it's truly a, an interesting case study of, of uh, I don't know the evolution of personality disorder Brian Stars Brian Stars Brian Stars Brian Stars. This video is cold. It's lifeless. And Brian seems cold and lifeless too. He doesn't have friends. He doesn't have an audience that loves him anymore. And it seems like along the way, he lost the real Brian. Clawed his way into doing a career that he loved. And he found a group of people who loved him. And he found friends. Um, and he found the confidence to be who he wanted to be. I think that's really cool. I also think that Brian developed a bit of a god complex. I think you're gonna lose yourself along the way. Like I said, I saw Brian at 2015 Warped, and it was, it was surreal to see this person. Even though I was angry at him, I didn't know he was covering up for Austin Jones, but I didn't like the fact that he wasn't speaking up for Damon and wasn't speaking out against Austin. I could also tell that at that point, Johnny was just a prop for Brian. He was just a cute emo boy to help him sell tickets and get clicks for his thumbnails. <laughs> I really wanted to say hi to Johnny because Johnny was right next to him when Hello. I saw Brian, but I didn't uh, because I knew I'd have to talk For to him. For the record, I met Johnny um, when I was a fan, um, when I met Brian, and Johnny was the sweetest, so just got to say that. Brian wore sunglasses and <laughs> tried to not make eye contact with me. Brian, if I went up to Johnny. <laughs> no, I don't want to fucking talk to you, dude. I have to talk to that curly-haired motherfucker. Uh-uh. So that's the Brian Star story. All right, well, that is it, friends. I'm glad, I'm really glad that we watched the version um, with Johnny's commentary because I feel like I could play a lot, uh, play off of what he had to say a lot. I do like that Nate and Johnny both, Johnny's always been, um, you know, so, so, uh, sees the best in everyone, I guess. Um, I like that they gave him the benefit of the doubt and, you know, kind of saw things from his perspective, especially in the very beginning when Nate brought up, like, you know, it was probably hard for Brian to adjust to life over here in America when he was younger. And that might be a lot of the reason why he became the way he did, you know, interesting, interesting points of view. And I'm glad that I heard them all when we went through it. It was very much like everything was hush hush because when we when MD was falling apart before I got fired from talent shop, like I was still under contract. I wasn't allowed to talk about any of this stuff. And then once I was, you know, officially separated from them, I didn't want to talk about this stuff because A, it was kind of like time had gone by and B, like we were just trying to move on and like like let the dust settle and shit. So it is, I know it's years later and um yeah, I mean, we're so far removed from the situation, but in a way that's like, it's the perfect time to talk about it because I've had, I've had years to think about it. I've had years to, you know, live in it. Obviously, like Johnny said, there's still years after like where Nate wraps up this video where like the saga continues and I'm sure it will for the rest of our lives. But it is nice to, um, you know, be in a place where we can talk about this shit and like, I don't know. I don't know. Don't you dare say that it's too bad. You're too two-faced to ever pick a side. And it's too bad. You're too two-faced to make up your fucking mind. We'll split.